you, you've written a, a wonderful book about proofs and the art of mathematics. So what can you say about proving stuff in mathematics? What is the process of proof? What are the tools? What is the art? What is the science of proving things in mathematics? So this is something I find so wonderful to teach young mathematicians who are learning how to become mathematicians and learning about proof. And I wrote that book when I was teaching such a proof writing class in New York. Mm -hmm. So many universities have such a course, the proof writing course, which is usually taken by students who have learned some mathematics. Usually they've completed maybe the calculus sequence and are making the kind of transition to higher mathematics, which tends to involve much more proof and it's a kind of challenging step for them. So the many math departments have this kind of course on proof writing where the students would get exposed to how to write proofs. And I wasn't happy with most of the other books that exist for those kind of courses. And the reason was that they were so often so dull because they would concentrate on like these the totally uninteresting parts of what it's like to write a proof, this kind of mechanistic procedures about how to write a proof. You know, if you're going to prove an implication, then you assume the hypothesis and argue for the conclusion and so on. And all of that is true and fine, and that's good to know, except if that's all that you're saying about the nature of proof, then I don't think you're really learning very much. So I felt that it was possible to have a much better kind of book, one that was much more interesting and that had interesting theorems in it, that still admitted of elementary proof. So I wrote this book um, and tried to fill it with all of the compelling mathematical statements with very elementary proofs that exhibited lots of different proof styles in it. And so I found that the students appreciated it a lot. We should say, you dedicate the book to my students. May all their theorems be true, proved by elegant arguments that flow effortlessly from hypothesis to conclusion while revealing fantastical mathematical beauty. Is there some interesting proofs that maybe illustrate for people outside of mathematics or for people who just take math right. classes in high school and so on? Yeah, uh, let's do a proof. There's yeah. one in the book. We can talk about it. I think it's a nice problem. It's in the discrete math. Yeah, the 5.1, that one. More pointed at than pointing. Okay, so this is the following problem. Suppose you're gathered with some friends, you know, in a circle, and you can point at each other however you want, or yourself, whatever, it doesn't matter. And you can point at more than one person, you know, use all your fingers or your feet or whatever you want. So maybe you point at three of your friends or something, and they point at two or three of their friends or whatever, and one person is pointing at 10 people, and somebody isn't pointing at anybody maybe, or um, and various people are pointed at also, right? So the question is, could we arrange a pattern of pointing so that everyone was more pointed at than they are pointing at others? So in other words, maybe there's seven people pointing at me, but I'm only pointing at five people. And maybe there's, you know, 20 people pointing at you, but you're only pointing at 15 people or something like that, right? So I want to know, there's an, a similar question on Twitter. For, for a group of people on Twitter, could you arrange that everyone has more followers than following? Yeah, it's the same question. Yeah. Mathematically, it's identical. Yeah. Although, I don't know, it's not identical because I said you could point at yourself, and I think that's not... Can you follow yourself? No, I don't think so. No. I don't think you can. Okay. So, can you arrange it so that everyone is more pointed at than pointing? And in my book, I give a couple of different proofs of this. I think I give an induction proof, and there's another proof. I think there's three different proofs in there. But why don't we just talk about the my favorite proof? Suppose it were possible to arrange that we're all more pointed at than pointing. Okay. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to agree. We're going to give a dollar to everyone that we're pointing at. Yeah. Okay. And so what happens? Everybody made money because I was pointed at by more people than I'm pointing. So I got. $10, but I only paid out $7. And similarly, you got paid $20, but you only paid out $15. So if everyone is more pointed at than pointing, then everyone makes money. But 
it it's obviously impossible for us to make money as a group by just ch- trading money with ourselves. Mm-hmm. And therefore, it can't be possible that we're all more pointed at than pointing. And this proof illustrates something. It's one of my habits that I suggest in the book to anthropomorphize your mathematical ideas. So mm-hmm. you should imagine that the mathematical objects that are playing a role in your question are people or active somehow animals or something that maybe have a will and a goal and so on. This is this process of anthropomorphizing. And and it often makes the problems easier to understand because we all are familiar with the fact that it's difficult to make money. And the proof is totally convincing because of our knowledge that we can't make money as a group by trading dollars between us, you know, without any new money coming into the group. Mm-hmm. And, but that by itself is actually a difficult mathematical claim. I mean, if if someone had to prove that, that you can't make money by trading in within a group, you know, it can't be that everyone in the group makes money just by shifting money around in the group. Maybe you think that's obvious. And it is obvious if you think about money. But if you had asked the question, you know, about mathematical functions of a certain kind and so on, then maybe it wouldn't be as clear as it is when you're talking about this money thing because of we we can build on our human experience about the difficulty of getting money and, you know, or other resources. It doesn't have to be money. It could be candy, whatever. You know, we just know that you can't easily get more things in that kind just by trading within a group. And we should say that sometimes the power of proof is such that the non-obvious can be shown, and then over time that becomes obvious. So in the context of money or social systems, there's a bunch of uh, things that are non-obvious. And the whole point is that proof can guide us to to the truth, to the accurate description of reality. We just proved a a property of money. (laughs) (laughs) It's interesting to think about, well, what if there were infinitely many people in your your group? Then it's not true anymore. The, the, The theorem fails. In fact, you can arrange that everyone is strictly more pointed at than pointing. And also you can, if everyone has, uh, has even just $1 bill, Mm-hmm. then you can arrange that afterwards everyone has infinitely many dollar bills. Because in terms of cardinality, that's the same. It's just, say, countable infinity in each case. If you had countably many friends and everyone has one dollar bill, then you can arrange a pattern of passing those dollar bills amongst each other so that afterwards everyone has infinitely many dollar bills. What you need is for each person to be attached to you know, one of the train cars or something. So uh, think of everyone as coming from Hilbert's train. But also think of them as fitting into Hobart's Hotel. So just have everyone on the nth car give all their money to the person who ends up in the nth room. So they each give $1 to that person. So afterwards, that person has infinitely many dollars, but everyone only paid out $1. So it's a way of making it happen. 